Cool. All right. Uh, all right. So we'll go through a little bit of updates. Hello, everyone. Uh, Tuesday. Hope you're all doing good. Uh, just wanted to show off some of the scores on the uh, on the server. And yeah, we already have some people who've uh, finished things, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, Mad Stork 2 and Relieved Otter. Um, and there's other people. Uh, you see people who don't have a name in the form uh, adjective, uh, I don't know, what is this, noun, person, whatever, number. Uh, like these people are TAs. Um, so, you know, don't worry about them. Uh, they're also doing the levels so they can make sure that they can help you. Uh, but yeah, get started. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people, like I said, as it goes on, it's pretty easy just by looking at this list to see what's the, um, what's kind of considered the easiest levels and what are considered more difficult. Um, so yeah, use this to kind of target different levels and work your way up. Um, if you haven't started again, get started right away. This stuff can take a while. Um, yeah, but cool. I'm glad to see, uh, awesome progress being, um, being made here. Cool. Okay. Now on to the next big uh, uh, announcement or uh, the next big thing in class. Um, okay. So on uh, Thursday, we're going to be having our first in-class CTF. This is going to be, I'm calling it uh, 365 CTF. Um, If you've been wondering, the dates have been posted on the homepage. So under the important dates, we have the in-class CTFs. Um, and so uh, basically what we're going to do is um, it's going to be in-class, of course, virtual, right? Won't actually be in-class. Um, and we're going to do this all virtually. And so we're going to do this on Thursday. So Thursday at this exact time, you know, 1030 AM, just like normal class time, we're going to be starting and kicking off the CTF. Um, we will. So the first step for everyone is to form teams by tomorrow at 5 PM. Um, so the idea is you can uh, group up as teams into groups of teams. I think this is um, just like a normal CTF. It's really helpful when you're stuck on something to have other people to ask questions to. Um, to try to um, bounce ideas off of. And so, you know, it's actually a really important part of CTFs to do them as a team. Um, we're going to cap a maximum of five people on a team, so it's not super unwieldy. Um, and so basically, um, figure out uh, from, you know, from people, you know, in class, uh, people you've met, you know, you at least know 30 people's emails because you've uh, signed their keys. Um, and there's a, a Piazza server and discussion board where you can try to get teams. So come together, find a team, um, maximum five people on a team, elect a yes, maximum five people. So I don't, um, so elect a Captain, well, if there's a bunch of teams that already have six people, take one from each and they can form a team of five. Um, elect a captain for your team. So this captain will be your main point of contact. Um, all right, you guys already have teams. Why do you already have teams? I guess I can change it to a max of six. I guess that could be fine. You planned planning ahead. It sounds like you didn't plan ahead if you didn't know how many people were allowed on a team. Oh, I did say five to six if you elected to go. Okay, cool. All right. Cool. There we go. All right. Six people. So maximum of six people on a team. Forget what I said earlier. Yeah, if I already said that, then that's fine. It gets a little unwieldy, but uh, I mean, what's one more person? Um, okay, max six people. Uh, elect a captain for your team. The captain will be the main point of contact for us. Um, basically, if anything goes wrong, you can blame it on your captain. 
and then uh, decide on a team name. Uh, let's see, I'd rather you be part of a team. I mean, I guess you can be a team of one if you really want to, but um, I don't know, CTFs can be a little bit of a lonely process, so it's much better if you have people on your team. And so I would highly recommend grouping up. Um, I guess I won't force you, but I would highly recommend it. And so decide on a team name and register your team with the class. So we'll post on Piazza of how to do that. So you'll register and tell us um, how many people, uh, which people are on your team, what your team name is, and who the captain is. Uh, then step two, prepare. So install the tools that we've been talking about. Um, oh, if you, oh, I would say just uh, post on Piazza in that case. So if you don't know anyone and you just want a team, just post on Piazza. Hey, I'm looking for teammates, and I'm sure people will pick you up. Um, so basically install all the things that we've talked about so far, I mean, you know, network analysis tools, reverse engineering tools, um, maybe crypto stuff. Think about all the things we've covered in class so far. These are the types of things that will be on the, the first CTF. Um, and then your next step is to compete. So the, your, you know, the captain's job is to make sure your entire team joins the in-class CTF on April 16th. Um, We'll be setting up, the undergrad TAs will set up a Discord server that we'll use to coordinate during the CTF. Um, so each of the teams will have their own private chat and voice channel that they can use to coordinate during the CTF. Also, the undergrad TAs, the TAs and myself will be on this Discord server so we can help uh, answer te technical questions and any other things that come up uh, during the CTF so we can kind of monitor and be there all in one space. Um, so the CTF is intended to be the length of the class. It'll be uh, kept up basically until, so the goal is uh, compete in the CTF and then you write and submit a CTF write-up. So this is um, what you're gonna be graded on. Um, and this is actually traditional in CTFs. So for actually, I think all of the top CTFs, the organizers require that the winning teams or the top X teams submit a write-up of how they solved various challenges. This kind of helps as a check to make sure that people actually did solve those challenges. Um, we'll post the exact CTF Discord as we get closer. We're still figuring all that out. So yes, we'll be using our own Discord server for this, uh, for the CTF. Um, no, you won't be. So you're graded on the write-up. So there'll definitely be challenges that everyone can solve. So there's there'll be a wide range of challenges here um so you know you will definitely be able to solve challenges what we really want to see and this is the important part right we want to see how you solved each of the challenges that you solved right so what steps did you take to solve this um and how so the other important thing obviously i'm not expecting every team to solve all the challenges although that would be great um what I really want to see is how did you attempt to solve each of the challenges that you didn't solve, right? So your write-up will have uh, a section for each of the challenges and you'll write up a few sentences or a paragraph about how you solved each of the ones that you solved and how you attempted to solve each of the challenges you didn't solve. Um, I'd say template is just plain text file. So plain text file, you know, challenge A, here's how we tried to solve that. Challenge B, we did solve this, here's how we solved it, and so on and so forth. Uh, your captain, you know, I'm not expecting a huge long essay, um, but I want, it should be clear that your team actually did solve this and that you attempted to solve each of the ones that you didn't actually solve. Um, one write-up per team. So your captain will be responsible for submitting the write-up on a grade scope uh, by Friday at noon. So this gives you roughly a day. So it's it's not going to be, um, you know, I'm not expecting a super in-depth report, but I want to see that you played during the in-class CTF and that you attempted all of the challenges. So people ask about grades. So if we go to syllabus, so CTFs are 5% of your grades split between two, it'll be two and a half percent each. Um, and you're graded based on your write-up. So again, yeah, it's it's not doesn't matter if you're the best or the worst team as long as your team is participating, trying to solve these challenges, 
and has a coherent and uh, good plan for their write-up, uh, that would be fine. Yes, there'll definitely be a scoreboard. Uh, your team will be able to solve at least one or more of the challenge challenges. Um, so I'm not going to talk anything about what's going to be on the CTF. Yes, the write-up the write-up is due Friday at noon. Uh, yes, we will use the, yeah, let's see, uh, you're not required. If you have your own communication methods, that's fine. Um, but if you want our help, so during class, we will be on that Discord server. So if you, there's some problems or anything, um, we'll be on that server and that way we have a central place where you can come find us. Does that make sense? Yeah, if you have your own whatever collaboration platform, chat thing, your own Discord server, that's fine. No, we're going to do CTF in class, so no teaching during that day. Any other questions? Discord is like a chat thing, like uh, Slack, that has actually nice um, voice chatting and other types of features. So uh, we can all be on one system. You can real-time ping us for help. Um, you can do voice chat with your team. So the CTF is in class. It will be open until Friday noon. So if your team, if you want to work on stuff out of class, you're more than welcome to do that. I think that's totally fine. Um, but no, it's not going to be, you know, I'm not, I really want you to be working on it during class. Cool. Any other questions? All right, cool. This will be fun. So, uh, pay, you know, keep uh, up to date on Piazza. We'll be posting more info on there in terms of, uh, you know, links to how to register your teams, uh, information about how to get to the CTF Discord, all that kind of fun stuff. So, uh, we'll be doing everything on there. Um, and this is the real Discord server you're sending out, right? Not the fake one that you use to scam people. I hope so. People mentioned. Uh, people talked about that at the last class. So they, um, yeah, they got, that's how they scammed people effectively. Um, cool. Okay. Homework six. How does extra credit work? Uh, yeah. You don't need to submit to grade scope by the date posted. Uh, I'm keeping track on the server. So as people solve things. All right, let's get into more binary exploitation. Cool. All right. Oh, hello. Well, there's no point in scamming anybody anymore, so I think you're fine with whatever server you end up on. All right. Cool. Okay, so what we're going to do now is uh, we're going to talk about, so we've talked about... Um, kind of more theoretical ways of thinking about how to exploit an application, right? We've been th thinking about and talking about how can I, and really when we talk about exploitation, right, we're trying to think about how can I make this application do something that it's not supposed to do, right? And so, um, and we've talked about different ways conceptually of how to think about that, right? We want to analyze an application, see what it does, see what information, uh, how it takes input from us as a user, and then how can we use that in order to subvert the behavior of the application? Um, these are a list of kind of um, some of the attack classes, like different types of vulnerabilities that I go over in my grad 545 class. 
that's um, about that goes into depth inside of each of these. So for this class, we're going to focus on just the ones that are in black here. Uh, path attacks, command injections, and um, stack corruption and buffer overflow attacks. Uh, this should kind of get you started down this path of exploiting binaries. If you really want to go further in this, you can take 466 to go this uh, in depth, or you can uh, even take uh, 545 where we kind of get into in depth all of these issues. Um, so the first thing, like the entire kind of class of file access and tax is um, essentially based on how, it, if we think about it, how do applications typically interact with the file system, right? What they do is it's all based on strings, right? So if we want to, and we talked about this, I think a little bit last time, um, open uh, temp foo, right? What I'm doing here is I'm opening a file and uh, read only or whatever the flags are here, right? Or read right. Um, so I'm trying to open a file and I specify to the operating system what file I want to open based on this string, right? And what can happen is basically if uh, we want to attack, and we're talking about local attacks here mostly, um, but if we want to, so if we want to attack an application and we want to, if we have a way to control how or when an application builds its path, we can trick the application to violating the security property of the system. So actually one of the most well-known types of these vulnerabilities is called the dot dot attack or a directory traversal attack. And this is something that is actually, you know, common, not just in binary applications where we're learning about it here, but it's also common in web application vulnerabilities. Um, the essential idea here is if, you're writing code, right? And the really important thing when thinking about these types of vulnerabilities is when you got to have to put yourself in the minds of the developer, right? So let's say I'm a developer. I want to write an application that uh, reads from a file. So I have some kind of application and I have uh, like, uh, yeah. So let's say uh, I'm writing a note application and so my application looks in the local directory uh, notes. Uh, inside that directory, I store all the notes about a user. So a user can ask me for a certain note and I will give it to them, right? So if I'm actually doing this, right, what would this uh, code kind of look like, right? It would be, um, so I would have something like my path here. So I'm gonna build up a path. Um, and could be many different ways, but let's do for right now uh, an S printf and I'm going to, of course, I'm writing bad uh, C code. So I'm going to make sure I'm doing it right. Um, so if I want to print to, um, notes percent S. And my first argument is, uh, and let's just say for all for argument's sake that I have a character pointer somewhere up here uh, called the note. Right, so I call some function that gets it from the user, and then that returns me a character pointer that I I then concatenate. Right, so uh, s printf is uh, going to print uh, da, da, da. format, yeah. All right, we'll have to do this securely since it's a security class. Uh, SN printf. And da, 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 da. the string path the mount 2047 just to be safe okay so essentially what i'm doing here is i'm um and so it's important to think okay what is this code intended to be right so then i have an open and uh int in fd equals open 
uh, path o read write. And then let's say I just uh, output. Uh, it's nice to just be able to make functions do whatever you want. Output to user fd. So this function will just uh, output everything that it reads in from this file descriptor to the user. Right. So. If we think about it, what does the developer intend? So let's walk through the actual functioning of this code, right? So here I'm getting um, the note from the user. So maybe it's an argument, uh, maybe uh, it's an argv, so maybe it's an argument from the user. Maybe I ask on standard input um, what it does. So sn printf is like um, a printf, so you can uh, take it here. Let's see. Uh, smprintf writes to the character string string, and it writes at most size minus one of the characters. So I can actually do 2048. So it's going to write uh, 2047 characters at most, and then finish it with a null byte. So the um, the way to read this. So it's a, in the printf family of functions. So it's going to have this format string. And then when it sees this percent %s, it's going to substitute the first argument and interpret this as a string and copy it into there. And then um, the n part of sn printf limits how many bytes it's going to write into this string. So this is this means that it's going to do at most um, 2048, including the null byte. So this means that whatever the user types in, it's not going to write more than 2048 to this buffer on the stack. Uh, to this argument. So after this, essentially, so if you were if you're writing this in something like Python, you would say uh, you just do open something like open uh, dot slash notes plus the note, something like that uh, would be the equivalent, right? So all we're doing is concatenating the user's input, so whatever they wanted to do for the note, we're concatenating it to this um, string dot slash notes. So this is definitely not a format string attack. That's uh, very different. Uh, we can talk about that maybe briefly later on once we cover this stuff. Uh, but let's go over what this actually allows you to do, right? So, right, and, and again, we can see from here, right, we can see exactly what the developer intended, right? We can see the developer's intent here is that they should only be they should only be outputting files that are inside of the notes directory, right? Because everything they're prefacing is dot slash notes. So in the current directory, um, the notes directory, and then getting notes from there, right? But is that so that's kind of we can see that here, that's the intended security property of this application. But um, but can an attacker violate that security property? So let's actually walk through this, um, this code kind of virtually and think, OK, so we'll go through different scenarios. So what if uh, the note is equal to uh, foobar? Right, let's say I've stored a note foobar. What's going to happen? So the note's going to be foobar. This sn printf, it will be path, uh, path will be equal to dot slash notes foobar. And then it will call open with dot slash notes foobar. And then it will output the whatever's inside dot slash notes foobar, which is exactly what we want. This is how our application is supposed to work, right? And so I haven't violated the the security property of this application at all because I'm reading from a file that's inside the notes directory, which is exactly what the developer wanted. Now, uh, what are different ways that we can go outside of a directory in Linux? And actually on most file systems now. Yeah, dot dot represents the parent directory, right? So now uh, what if the note is equal to dot dot slash dot dot slash dot dot slash dot dot slash edc password, right? 
And the code here doesn't care, right? The code doesn't care that the note has any special characters or anything, right? So what's gonna happen? Well, the code's gonna execute just as normal. Path is going to do dot slash notes slash, and then it just appends these strings together, right? It's concatenating these strings. So it'll be dot dot slash dot dot slash dot dot slash dot dot slash EDC password. And then it will do open dot slash notes. And it will output this file, right? So the file system, right? When when we call open on the file system, then what happens with all these dot dot slashes, right? It allows the attacker to traverse the directory and be able to access files outside of this directory, right? So what this is doing is, depending on assuming that notes is at least four away from etc password and assuming that this is this note application is set UID, this would allow us to read the etc password file or etc uh, shadow like we talked about, which actually has the hashes of passwords. Uh, maybe that's better. And so now we've tr essentially tricked this application to open and read a file for us that we should not have access to. Right, because the application by default should only be able to read from the notes directory. But we have been able to trick it by providing input that means something special to this open system call of these dot dot of uh, the parent directory input. And so you can do this um, to trick an application to open different files that it wasn't expecting. Uh, to be able to read those files, maybe it's to execute those files. This is actually a very general purpose um, type of exploit and vulnerability. Uh, this happens on uh, web applications, like I mentioned. So often web applications will have this type of functionality where it will read from a local file from the web server. So if you point it to a file like etc password, etc shadow, any of these files, you can then maybe read a file on the file system that you shouldn't be able to read. So in PHP, local file inclusion, the inclusion part means that you're including it and executing it code, which is different, right? So it can be both because PHP, if you did uh, include this and there's no PHP tags in there, it won't interpret it as PHP and it will output it to you. So it's essentially also a directory traversal. So yeah, so how to prevent this, right? So, um, so, what do we actually need to do here to prevent this, right? So there's actually, in terms of prevention, there's typically two types of approaches that you can take. Um, so uh, one approach is whitelisting, right? We could say, so what should our files be made out of? Right. What? So for a whitelist, we say exactly what makes for good input. So what should the note be? Yeah, for instance, what if I am. So if we think about this as a regular expression. Right. If I make the, the note only consist of lowercase a through z and reject everything else, so say a note can only be A through Z, then um, I've completely prevented this vulnerability, right? Because there's no possible way that an attacker controlled dot dot slash can ever reach um, the open syscall, right? But I'd have to add a check in here, right? Uh, check the note. And this would completely get rid of this vulnerability, right? Um, but it actually has some downsides, right? So if I restricted them to only A through Z, what if my user says, but I have a, what if I have a very complicated note that they want to put dashes between or, uh, or underscores, right? To have it be more readable, right? Or like you said, there you go, .txt.
Um, and, and so this, um, so right. So extensions, right. So by whitelisting, we're restricting, uh, what we can be where maybe with blacklisting, we could say, well, let's, uh, block any dot, dot. So check, uh, if the note has dot dot slash, then reject, right? So here I'm saying, okay, I know what's bad. What's bad is them being able to traverse outside of this directory. So I'm gonna block any dot dot. And I say, if the note has any dot dot in it, then I reject it, right? And I and the problem is like people are, are mentioning in the chat that um, that um, the problem is, and especially this is what happens in, in web applications. So you think, okay, to prevent this is very easy. Just make sure no dot dot ever makes it to your application. Um, the problem is attackers may have different way of trying to encode their input. Um, so on the web, you can encode this as percent encoding, double percent encoding. There's all kinds of crazy tricks to try to do. Um, here, I don't think there are any tricks. Um, but you could also, you know, depending on the structure of notes, you may be able to um, get them to open up folders or files inside the notes directory that maybe is a different user's notes or something like that. Um, um, so we could also say let's, another type of trick would be filtering. So we'd say, uh, let's transform any dot dot to just the empty string so remove it and in that case uh all of these would get removed so we just have notes 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 and that would try to access the file etc shadow in the notes directory um which all get the extra slashes don't matter it's all going to get uh um, transformed to just one slash And so, cool, okay, so yeah, so these are kind of the two different ways. Uh, whitelisting is the best approach of saying, okay, I know exactly what input is safe, but fundamentally, um, yeah, so this is the other problem with that. That's a good uh, example. So if you just say, let's transform any dot dot to uh, empty, I'm just gonna steal this. And of course it's gonna do weird because it likes to keep the format. Um, then if my input is, uh, if the if uh, the note I put in as triple, and I transform uh, every dot dot to empty, I think I may need more here to actually get this to work. No, this still should strip them out. This is a bad example. Okay, I have other examples we'll do later. Um, there we go, dot, dot, slash to empty. Yeah, that would actually make sense. Um, you could also maybe try disallowing slashes Right, saying, okay, well, I know slash is a special character and I don't want slash to be in anybody's username. So I can try that as a technique. And now I just reject anything with a slash in it. Right, and there that makes it so the attacker would not be able to escape out of that directory. Um, but fundamentally, the fundamental problem here and the reason why this is a vulnerability is because if we look at this code and we think about it as what is attacker controlled, so here, the note is attacker controlled because it comes from the user and then it gets used in something here, gets copied to path and then it's used to open a file without any whitelisting, blacklisting, filtering, any type of sanitization, then this represents a potential um, vulnerability, right? And the important thing is why, why are we saying potential, right? 
the problem is uh, it depends on what the application is. So like, if, for instance, if you said uh, the application cat has a vulnerability because I can do dot dot slash dot dot slash dot dot slash to output any file. Well, of course, that's the functionality of the application cat. It literally will output whatever file. Uh, the important thing is that cat does not run. Uh, there's no set UID bit here, right? So cat runs as your privileges. Uh, not as root. So it doesn't matter that you can use cat to output any file because it only has access to what you have access to. So again, remember the vulnerability is context dependent on the application. Um, so this is something that's super important to keep in mind uh, because it's easy to say, oh, look, they're using user input uh, in this way, but you know that may or may not be vulnerable. It depends on the specific application. Um, other things that influence the, the permissions would be, I think of it probably more in terms of uh, deployment security, right? So thinking about the life cycle of the application, the application could be secure, but it's deployed or configured incorrectly. Right, so that kind of depends. And it also depends on if it's something that comes as part of the operating system and is misconfigured, that could be one thing or the other. Cool. So, um, okay. So then the other thing to think about is, so this is one way that an attacker can influence what files are being opened based on using their input in order to, um, influence that behavior. Um, you just gotta, yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, yes, and this is why there are still so many vulnerabilities. You have to be very cautious of any possible user input, any way that you're using it potentially insecurely or passing it to a sensitive function that has special characters that mean different things, right? If we pass this to a different function, these dot dots don't mean anything, but they only are important because it's passed to the open function. And so, yeah, this is really the source of uh, the reason why all why vulnerability still exists in you know things like web applications and various types of things cool okay so i'll go on here um okay so i think we talked about this and discussed this a little bit um so how does my shell right so i'm talking now uh i think i can see exactly which shell i'm using echo shell Right, so I'm actually talking to Bin Bash here. I'm not talking to anybody else. And so what I wanna know is when I type in ls, how does the shell know exactly which ls program to execute? How does it know that it's in Bin? Well, so one thing we can do is I can ask it how. So I can use this program called which, which will tell me uh, where the program is located. I can even use which which to see that which is actually in a different directory. It's in user bin which. Um, yeah, so it needs, so we need, because if we had to think about this, if every time you wanted to list a directory, you had to type slash bin ls, or you had to type in wish, you would probably first type in bin wish and then be like, oh, that doesn't exist. Uh, oh, I guess it does. Wait, that's weird. Hmm, I wonder if they're different. Uh, that's interesting. So you'd have to remember exactly where the programs were in order to run them. It'd be a headache, right? So there's a very nice feature where this path environment variable is used by, I actually don't know. I don't know what where is is. I always use which. Um, so what your shell does, right? If we do env, this is um, all of the environment variables. Remember we discussed the environment. They're a set of name value pairs that are actually, this whole set is copied into every program uh, essentially that you execute. And one of these is the path. So the path is what the shell uses in order to determine how should I look for programs to execute when the user just types in ls, right? So we can see first thing that gets looked, and this is a, if we look at this, this is a colon separated list. Um, so it's first looking in uh, user local s bin, which there is nothing, and then it's going to look into user local bin, which has some stuff, uh, including the leap program, and it then we'll look in 
user s bin which has some other programs and where are we here and then user bin and then slash s bin slash bin apparently user games for some reason user local games and then the snap bin oh interesting cool so it's a symbolic link there Right, so exactly what what Bash is doing is it's looking every time in this list for the exact file that you um, execute, right? So, and this is super handy. It's something that is a fundamental part of how we use um, how we use our shell is we don't want to have to type in exactly slash bin slash ls, um, but remember the operating system the function that actually invokes a new process to the operating system is execve. It needs a full file name argument, right? So it needs the entire path to that binary. You can't just tell the operating system, hey, exec ls and then figure it out. Yes, so you can, and this is actually super useful. So on my, on my system, I hope there's nothing private in here. I don't think so. But yeah, you can see my path is kind of littered with all kinds of crazy stuff. So what are some things I have in here? Like uh, user local opt MySQL bin. Um, I have, oh yeah, I ha usually have my own uh, bin directory. Um, so this is in my home directory slash bin. Um, and I have, I don't know, all other stuff that gets added with uh, Python stuff and RVM stuff and uh, all kinds of things. So, um, so yeah, you can actually use this as a very nice way of uh, doing this. So, um, and okay, so applications uh, normally, uh, so this is a very handy feature And okay, so we need to think of other things. Okay, the other thing, so we just talked about path, how path is useful. Uh, and let's think. So, okay, the other thing that we'll talk about really quickly that's used is home. So why, why is tilde special to the shell? Yeah, it's, it's actually, but the question then is, how does your shell know where your home directory is? And it actually is, it uses this environment variable uh, home, right? So if we look at ENV, we have the things we talked about are path, and another thing we talked about is home. Um, and so this home directory, um, So if I look at my present working directory, home Ubuntu test, and I can say home equals uh, home. And, and if I CD to tilde, it will put me into this directory, right? So, so tilde is being expanded by the shell into, um, whatever this environment variable home is. Okay, so why these things are important. So home, tilde, path. Um. Okay, so this is because it is very easy to, there is a, so like, um, we talked about, and this is kind of an important thing to, uh, right? An important distinction to make is that exec VE is an, um, right, is the operating system call. Um, so this is what actually talks to the app to the um, uh, 
uh, exec VE is what our applications use to talk to the the operating system to say, hey, ec please execute this new file um, and pass it this, this argument list and pass it this environment variable. But when we're writing applications, oftentimes we don't wanna have to deal with all that jazz. We want um, an easier way to do this. Uh, so we need a, yeah. So like if, okay, so let's think about this. So actually, if we think about this, all of this nonsense that I had here, right? I had a whole function here to try to output this file descriptor to a user. But there's actually already a very useful program uh, that will output things to standard out. And it's part of kind of the Unix philosophy of things that I should reuse what applications are available rather than reinventing the wheel. So I might write something like uh, system cat notes uh, hello world, right? And the system is actually, so system is not an OS system call. It's in uh, libc. It's a library that, uh, and this is exactly what it tells us that it does, is it uh, uses fork, so it creates a child process, executes the shell command exactly as if you typed it into your command line of slash bin sh, uh, the argument zero sh dash c, and then the command that you type in. Um, so it's exactly as if, uh, oh, I don't wanna change my home back. Uh, notes. So, um, so when I do system cat notes, uh, hello world, exactly what's happening is under the hood, what system in libc is doing is it's translating everything to an exec VE call that calls bin sh and dash c and then my command cat notes hello world, which is super useful, right? Because now I can use the cat binary, right? I don't have to reuse all this functionality of how to read and write files, do all that fancy stuff. And so how does bin sh know what cat e program to execute? Right, so bin sh is just another shell. So I can actually start executing it. It's, uh, and actually on, uh, let's see, Ubuntu, bin sh is actually linked to dash, and so is, uh, oh no, it's not. Um, so I can execute bin sh, cat notes, right? So bin sh has all the same environment variables and it uses the exact same lookup as uh, my, my shell does as bash. So when I do something like um, cat notes hello world, what it's doing is it's crawling the path. So for instance, if I did uh, export I think just like this should get rid of it. And now if I do cat notes, hello world, right? It'll tell me cat isn't found because it's not able to find it in the path. So bin sh is when you call system, right? It's essentially, you got to think of it as it's exactly as if you were on a shell typing it in, right? Which means that it's using the exact same lookup with the path environment variable to look up uh, it it as another uh, executable. So, so it's looking through the path environment variables, looking for the first executable program it can find called cat, and then using that and executing that. So now what if I have, 
So what if I have a set UID program that calls system and uses something like cat notes, hello world, who controls the environment variables that are path to pass to an executable? Anyone? Thoughts? Yeah, the parent process or whoever passes it in, right? It's actually passed in as part of exec VE, the system call, this environment ENVP pointer. The person who executes this program can choose exactly whatever environment that they want. Um, so you can do things like... Uh, so we were looking at bin SH. Um, the really cool thing is you can specify... Uh, parameters on here so you can specify path as just hello and then a space and then the program you want to execute so this if I type in a echo uh, path it'll say hello and if I type in ls it'll tell me it's not able to find it so this is saying uh, execute bin sh and pass it the environment variable path equals hello so I can control this and I can even do this and I can control environment variables for set UID programs, right? So if, uh, so if I wanted to, let's say, um, rather than having the program call cat, how could I trick it into executing whatever I want to execute? Yeah, so if I, um, so I could uh, uh, create a directory called fake. I can uh, output something to cat. And then I could do uh, ba -ba 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 -ba, bin sh. Now I want my path to be test. And now if I say uh, cat notes hello. Ah, ah, ah. It's not executable. Oh, it's and it's also not test. Okay, good. That was a double test, okay. I have to make it executable. Boom, so now I've tricked it into executing a binary of my choosing and not of somebody else's. So in that way, if you have a and there's actually a number of functions. So system is one of them, um, exec LP, exec VP, and you can look up the uh, this family of functions. Um, remember, the only one that doesn't use it is uh, exec VE, right? Because that actually, that's actually the OS system call, but these other helper functions um, will use the shell path variable. Um, so similar things, like we talked about, if an application, oh, hello. Um, so similar things like we talked about, if an application uses tilde in order to uh, read and write a file, right, the home variable, just like an attacker control path in order to trick an application into executing a different binary than it was expecting, an attacker can use home environment variable to control the execution of commands, um, or sorry, to use the home variable to trick the application into thinking of what tilde represents and the directory that tilde maps to. So this can be another way that you can um, compromise the security of application using tricks like this of changing the environment, right? So we have a couple different ways. Uh, we can use a directory traversal in order to, if the application directly uses our input in order for a call to open. We can modify the environment that the application uses if that uh, allows us to trick it to executing different types of programs. Um, and finally,
kind of combining these two together is uh, an entire class of um, vulnerabilities called command injections. So one of the most uh, famous ones we looked at, so this was a system. So one way we could think of, um, can tilde become a remote location? Usually no. So uh, unless you have mounted some volume on your system. So tilde you can make be whatever a local uh, path is. I don't know about remote, I guess probably only if it's mounted. But I guess it depends on the application and whatever's uh, using tilde. So um, how to fix, uh, we'll go back a little bit, how to fix these path vulnerabilities, right? If I specify the exact location bin cat, right? If I go back to my example and if I do bin cat notes, hello world, I'll see that it works exactly right because the shell does not need to figure out what the cap, uh, what the cat application is. Um, you, I cannot just write over bin cat, right? Let's look at the privileges here, right? You're on this system. Can you write to bin cat, right? If you could write to bin cat, you could get me to execute code of your choosing, but it's owned by root and only root can write to it. We cannot write to it. Um, cool. Okay. So, <coughs> so one way to do this would be, um, to specify the entire path to the executable that we, we want to, uh, uh, execute. But now if we say, okay, let's go back to our original application, right? This, uh, this application and Man, this is really annoying, this output everything to the user. Uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna say, uh, my path is gonna be slash bin cat, and what I'm gonna do is say system path. Look, like I've gotten rid of, uh, what is this? However long this function is and this open, like I'm, it's actually a very nice kind of engineering thing here. I'm pushing off a bunch of functionality from my application. I'm able to delete a bunch of code and I'm able to reuse some other applications functionality to output this file name, right? So uh, bin cat dot slash notes and then the note. Um, and in fact, what do you think? You want to play with this a little bit? Let's uh, write this application. Um, cool. Okay. And I had to use Vim last time. Uh, okay, this uh, may take a little bit. Uh, int main. Okay, and uh, argc character pointer pointer. Ah, this is why I hate Vim. Okay. int main, int argc, character pointer pointer, argv. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is, let's, okay, what I'm gonna do is change the note to argv1. So this is how I'm getting it from the user. So getting the note from the user, right? So I'm getting the note and I'm gonna open up another terminal so I can make sure I have all my includes correctly. And I wanna be a good programmer, so I'm gonna return zero. And then at the top, I am going to um, ba -ba -ba, man sn printf. Include standard IO dot H, standard lib dot H. GCC test dot C. And let's see, do I have notes? Uh, notes. Yeah. 
So if I do a dot out hello world, it should output hello world, right? It's telling me the exact uh, program here. And so what is it doing, right? So let's actually look under the covers. Um, so we use S trace to trace the system calls that this is making. And there's a lot of stuff in here, like I think I said beforehand. Um, so what is happening? It is eventually calling, oh, it's calling fork, right? So it's, uh, we need to follow the child. Um, yeah. All right, trace uh, child process. Okay, so dash F. Okay, so it's forking a different process and then in that different process, there we go. So it's calling exec VE with slash bin uh, slash SH. Right, so this is exactly what system is doing. So the system call first forks a different process, a child process. Um, so the command ran to get the PIDs, I think is the dash F on S trace. So this means follow, when you have a fork, follow the child and print out all the system call traces from the child, which is what I wanted because I wanted to see this exec VE to see exactly what this is doing. Um, so this is calling exec VE, bin SH, SH dash C, slash bin cat uh, dot slash notes slash hello world, right? Cool, this all makes sense because we know, oh, we we're actually looking at system here. Let's make it a little bit bigger. Um, and we know that, ah, I don't like the documentation there because this one's so much better. This is telling us that this is exactly what it's doing. Slash bin sh, sh dash c, and then the command name, right? So this is exactly what it's doing, bin slash bin sh, sh dash c. So this interprets it as if it was on the command line. This is why normally if we could mess with this, uh, like before when it was just cat, then we could mess with the path in order to have it execute a different cat. But here the programmer has very wisely said, okay, only execute bin cat, right? This is the only program that I'm gonna execute and then put their argument as the second argument here. Um, so we can even, um, so the question is, what can we do with this? So again, the thing to remember is this is exactly as if uh, dash C, it's doing bin cat notes hello world, right? So if we give it our program, our little a dot out program, if we give it something like ls, it'll say uh, there's no such file or directory dot slash notes ls. Okay, but what can I do from here? So again, remember the really interesting part here is that. Um, Now we have input from a user, the note, right? Uh, test not C, right? So this input comes from the user. The argument variable comes from the user. If we assume this is a set UID program, this argument comes from the user. It's being used in something and then being sent to system, right? So let's ignore there is a directory traversal here, right? But yeah, the question is, what other things can we do on a shell? Right, So I can't use the path to trick it to execute a different program, but what if I did something like ls uh, slash, so what did this do? What happened here? What is this output that I'm seeing? Put another way, were we able to trick a dot out to execute something else? So yeah, the thing to remember is what does my shell do when it sees a semicolon, 
right? A semicolon is a way that I can do multiple commands on the same line, right? This is just ls three times. So what my shell does is it splits this up into two commands. It says, okay, first execute dot slash a dot out ls. It tells me that there's no such file or directory. And then it executes bin ls as essentially as me, right? So as, uh, as my user. And so how can I get, so I need to tell the shell, don't interpret anything inside this string, just pass it actually as an argument. And we can actually see this if we do s trace uh, dash f a dot out with this. We can go back here and we can look at the, um, the exec ve command, which is here, right? So it's exec ve, or we can even look at the, um, the exec ve bin sh sh dash c dot slash uh, bin slash cat dot slash notes ls. So everything after that didn't even make it into the program, right? And so the way we can tell, there's two ways we can do it. We can use escapes. So we can put a slash before the semicolon. Uh, that's one way to do it. Another way to do it is to uh, put everything in quotes, which should tell our program, okay, pass this in as if it's argv1, this entire thing. Don't interpret it um, as anything extra. So if we go in here, we look at the uh, exec ve. Come on. There we go. Uh, sh dash c slash bin cat dot slash notes ls semicolon bin ls. Right? So I've actually been able to. Uh, so here I was able to, if I get rid of the s trace. So how can I see that this is actually executing by a dot out? Um, let's look. So what I will do for now, making sure that nobody else can execute it. Yeah, so I will use my pseudo powers uh, to make a, a ch own a dot out uh, root root and pseudo uh, ch mod plus s. Not sure if that works. Um, Uh, that is wrong. All right. Well, how do I do chmod? Anyone know? Or uh, set UID? Ah, U uh, plus S. There we go. Cool, so now I have this very dangerous a dot out uh, binary that's executable for everyone and is set UID. And I also double checked that this directory is only executable by my user, so you will not be able to execute this file even if you're on this server right now. Um, uh, so, oh, 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 because I didn't put in anything here, right? So here's the program as normal. Um, and it's running as root, so I could use this to, uh, so now how can I prove that it's running as a different user, right? So let's look at our two different inputs so we can see. So if we do it without this, um, right? So when I run this, it's running user bin ID as my user, so it's running as the Ubuntu user. But now if I enclose this in quotes and pass this as an argument, uh, da, 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 da. Hmm. where is the, oh, 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 I know what's happening. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, 
So what's happening is, um, uh, by default, uh, the shell on modern Linux systems actually drops privileges. So if it's run as root, it will drop privileges. Uh, you have to do some special stuff in order to actually make that work. Uh, dang, uh, that was gonna be a cool example. Um, but all of the, let's say, uh, that's taken care of in all the assignments that it needs to be. Um, but essentially now I can get this program to do anything that I want and execute any commands, right? So some people had uh, other arguments. I could try piping, so a pipe uh, is one way. I could try a uh, backtick ID maybe. The problem is I don't want it actually executing, so I think I need to put quotes. Yeah. Um, so here I was able to get it to execute a program. Um, so yeah, so command injections, right? If an attacker can control a command that's passed there, um, <laughs> good try. Uh, not going to do that. Um, cool. So here's uh, another type of example that's using a command to output a log file. So you can check this and you can use this to, um, access different files that only the root user should be able to access. Um, so these type of vulnerabilities, again, command injection is another one that comes up all the time. Uh, web applications can have command injections. Um, and so um, there was actually a real, uh, one of the coolest vulnerabilities uh, is a vulnerability called Shellshock, which was a bug in the bash binary that um, was used basically when you pass environment variables to another instance of bash, it could pass a function definition. And in a function definition, you could execute code. And so um, essentially, so for example, like uh, with GitHub, right? You can access a Git server using SSH that has very limited access. Um, you could use this to break out of that restricted shell. Um, and you could do things like uh, access different environment variables. Also, so CGI web applications, a lot of web applications automatically created uh, variables. So you could get arbitrary code execution on a remote system just through one web, web request. And it's actually affected a lot of machines. Um, the crazy thing is that Shellshock was actually um, vulnerable. Like this bug was there for, I think, roughly 20 years and nobody found it. Like it was only through, um, some, finally somebody stumbled on this code and was like, hey, why is, is it doing this? Uh, uh, maybe this functionality could actually be used for code execution. Um, so yeah, it was a really interesting um, example of a type of code execution that's been around for a long, long time. Um, cool, so with that, we made a lot of ground on that. And when we get back, we will, uh, next week, we'll talk about uh, buffer overflows and all that fun stuff and cover oh, roughly 180 slides. Cool, see y'all in the CTF on Thursday.